Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to AgriFood Conversations brought to you by iSelect Fund, the Van Frump Report, the Yield Lab Institute, and Family Farms Group. This is Tom Bunn. I'm an associate on the iSelect Fund Ventures team, and I'm excited to welcome you all to our discussion today. AgriFood Conversations is all about driving innovation in food and ag. Each month, we highlight a specific theme, and this month's theme is oceans and aquaculture. On today's call, we are joined by Yannick Nyberg, founder and CEO of Seawater Solutions. Seawater Solutions is taking two of the world's most abundant resources, degraded land and seawater, and creating wetlands that capture carbon, create jobs, produce food, rewild the environment, clean waterways, and stabilize coastlines. Its mission is to restore degraded coastlines and create a greener future for coastal communities at the front line of climate change. As you know, uh, companies are more likely to succeed with the right network of customers, talent, investors, and advisors. We have invited you to this webinar because you are some of the smartest, most talented people in seawater solutions market. You're potential customers for their products and services. You've built a similar company or you have unique expertise and may understand the challenges and opportunities that seawater solutions may face. Before we get started, we have a quick poll question to get a better idea of who we have on the call today. Please take a moment to answer. While the poll is running, a couple process comments. We are not soliciting investment in any way whatsoever. This presentation is provide information to help Seawater Solutions find customers, mentors, and other strategic relationships that can help them grow their business. Secondly, you can use the Q&A box to ask a question at any time, and we will answer those questions uh, as time allows at the end of the presentation. Finally, this webinar is being recorded and will be available for replay. So with that, I am pleased to introduce Yannick Nyberg, founder and CEO of Seawater Solutions. Thanks for joining us today, Yannick. Uh, thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Can I get a confirmation of... of um, yes, we, we can hear you. Perfect, great, great, great. Um, yeah, well, good evening, everybody. My name is Yannick Nyberg, or good morning, and in, in, I think in most of your cases, I'm based in Glasgow at the moment. Uh, like in the intro, um, I'm the founder and director of Seawater Solutions, which is an agri-environmental engineering company um, that really ties conservation with livelihood generation um, and empowering oftentimes smallholder farmers uh, to turn degraded land into some of the most productive ecosystems in the world, all without using fresh water. Um, now, the salinity of our soil has been one of the most significant environmental and socioeconomic issues on the planet, uh, threatening over a third of the world's landmass and over 70% of farmland. Um, Salt-induced desertification and degradation affects nearly 2 billion people making the salinity of our soils one of the most significant causes of mass migration in the world. This is a huge focus for us uh, on our project countries. Um, now, over five years ago, we be began to look at potential solutions to this issue um, of salt, and we came across unlikely opportunities in coastal wetlands like mangrove forests, seagrass meadows, and salt marshes. Uh, while making up only 4% of the world's landmass, they are the most efficient biological reservoirs uh, of stored carbon on the planet, capturing over 30 times more carbon than tropical rainforests, for example, uh, and support uniquely 40% of all species in the world. So absolutely uniquely important, both in our fight against climate change, but also in aquaculture, marine health, et cetera. Um, in 2018, we began integrating these wetland ecologies with agriculture, placing farming um, communities at the center of environmental stewardship and developing new regenerative economies capable of producing a vast array of commercial products, all while restoring biodiversity, uh, cooling local temperatures, improving freshwater resources, and capturing a massive amount of carbon, all without fresh water. And so after initial success at a smallholder farmer level with partners like WFP and USAID, uh, we looked at scaling this approach to larger areas uh, of degraded land. Um, and this is where we really began to develop this idea of integrated wetland agroecologies agro on a very large scale. I mean, think about uh, your back gar garden aquaponics system 
this is that scale to a size of 10,000 uh, acres. So massive, massive scale. Um, and so the results were really staggering. In early iterations of the system, we saw an incredible 1,000% increase in biodiversity over two years and an annual carbon capture potential of around 170 tons per hectare, which is uh, really astonishing, among the highest of any major base solution, all while creating productive yields um, over three times that of rice or wheat in comparison, again, all without a single drop of fresh water. Um, that's right. And so here's a, here's a snapshot of what that looks like over a very short period of time, a transformation in a, one of our project countries in Ghana, uh, where salinization and deforestation, all these issues really leave whole landscapes completely barren. Uh, but within a, a short period of time, even as little as two years, you can transform that, you can restore watersheds, and you can create these really productive uh, agricultures in a very short period of time. Everything from aquacultures, shrimp, um, to saline crops that can be used for uh, a variety of industries from um, biomass generation to li li livestock feed to aquaculture feed, uh, and of course, just food in general. Uh, this is one of the pictures, um, which again, just really reflects that desert transformation and, and, and terraforming concept was one of an, an earlier project in Eritrea where 2,000 acres of land was over two years transformed um, into these productive salt marsh agroecologies. So again, really pushing the fact that this, this can happen in a very short period of time, very high carbon retention, et cetera. And in the context of the carbon sector and where that's going off the back of COP26 and uh, inter, um, international carbon policies, we're really seeing this industry jump to the forefront and allow for these kind of nature-based uh, green infrastructure projects to be financed um, right from the get-go through um, future carbon funding. And that's very key to what we do um, as well. So fast forward to 2021, or in this case, 2022, uh, we set up operations around the globe with uh, public and private sector partners like the World Food Program in Bangladesh, uh, and the UK version of USAID in places like Ghana uh, and Namibia. Um, and really, it's about creating life-changing income for smallholder farmers while restoring ecosystems. Um, and we have over kind of 500 users and beneficiaries, both on kind of large scale um, landowners all the way to a smallholder level with uh, secondary beneficiaries in the tens of thousands uh, across these project countries. And our relationship and what's really unique about this solution is how we really build these partnerships with public sector and private sector partners. Um, what we do is we typically use uh, initial development projects to build local capacity, um, train and engage with stakeholders, undertake due diligence and, and assess carbon opportunities, all while running projects over kind of a, a year long period. And this really allows us to scale to the point of bringing in private sector uh, partners that invest both in the carbon and in the community livelihoods activities or the secondary industries and markets that we're setting up for the productive elements that could be, you know, uh, formulated aquaculture feed, uh, that could be aquacultures or any of the other 30 to 50 different products that come off of these ecosystems really. Um, but this long-term carbon revenue really allows us to scale up, uh, create supply chains uh, and allows for market access for, for these kind of products, which typically does take a couple of years. So relying on, um, on the carbon sector to be able to finance and facilitate that is really, really crucial, especially when we're talking about working in, uh, in countries, particularly in the developing uh, world where lead time for uh, getting products to market is, is even higher than uh, elsewhere that we do work like our projects in Spain and, and elsewhere. So really at the core, Going back to the core of what we do at Seawater Solutions is the belief that conservation and livelihoods and economics are fundamentally tied to, together. By addressing kind of ecosystem health in social governance and livelihoods frameworks, we can link restoration to the economic prosperity of the communities at the, at the front lines of climate change. 
Now, with the scale of the problem and the growth of the carbon markets, the opportunity for restoration and livelihoods has never been greater. Um, and we have proven our technical viability in test sites across Africa, Asia, and Europe. Um, but now we're really calling on partners to support us, both from the public sector and, and more, more uh, honed into the private sector in terms of either carbon or really industries that engage with us through the, cr the creation of product and supply chains uh, for those productive elements of our technology, primarily in aquaculture, uh, novel uh, biotech, and of course, um, animal-based proteins. So I know I've got a couple minutes, but I, um, I'm going to end it there and open up for questions. But thank you all for listening. And um, there are some contact details there in case uh, you'd like to reach out independently. Thank you very much. Thanks, Yannick. Um, so I'm gathering that your, your specialties are um, the management consulting and the, the seawater farming. Is that, how would you when, you, when you think about your core competencies, what do you, what do you say first as far as what your specialty is? Because it's looking at your website, you know, a lot of the projects are, are very different in scope. Um, what's your ideal project and how do you describe your, your very core, your core, your most core competencies? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, obviously for us, from our standpoint, uh, it does change depending on the region we work in. Um, but overall, if I'd have to summarize that, we really are a project developer, um, both in terms of carbon projects, um, but also then in terms of the, the, the productive agricultures and agroecologies that we work in. Um, of course, there is a huge element of vertically integrating what we do. Um, you know, we're there at the start, we're developing projects, but we're also really um, establishing those markets. Um, and we're trying to, in many cases, when it comes to the, those countries in the developing world, we're really cutting out a lot of the middlemen in that um, and effectively developing projects all the way to the point where it's going to wholesale markets um, but I think one thing that's, um, that's interesting to note as well is that obviously when we started out five or six years ago, the onus really was on those productive agricultures, agroecologies, um, those productive elements of aquacultures and agricultures, uh, with carbon coming in as some kind of playing second fiddle, but that model has really been flipped, uh, simply because of the market opportunities out there. So today, typically we do identify ourselves as a, a carbon project developer, um, that develops with project projects and um, and works with with the carbon partners to really release VCUs, and of course those productive productive agro agroecologies and markets then play second fiddle in that scenario. So we flipped our model in that sense, um, really to facilitate um, kind of um, environmental and green commodity finance to to help bring projects online. Great, great. With that new with that new model, how would you describe your business the business plan now? Is it is it um, kind of value based in terms of in terms of total carbon captured, or or how do you what's the what's the business model at this point and going forward? Um, <clears throat> great question. So it really is at the moment based on on carbon. Um, simply because of what's happened over the last five years. I mean, this market has completely exploded. Uh, we're seeing this unbelievable um, deficit, I would say, of nature-based carbon projects out there. Um, there's a huge demand for these projects, uh, and that, that's obviously going to um, increase over time um, as certain policies and objectives come into play, especially in the blue carbon zone. Um, so our business model is really very much catered towards uh, carbon at the moment. Um, and just a little bit of context for those of you who aren't too familiar with uh, carbon in itself, the market, or even what blue carbon is, um, it is very much like uh, conventional investment. And in that sense, it can take so many different forms, uh, debt equity, um, you can have investment into you know, revenue-based investments into, um, you know, or even equity in, in, in that sense. So we're seeing a lot of different partnership models, financing models come up, but I would say just to give you an idea of one of the ones that we have been using uh, quite frequently is that 
carbon sponsors or investors are investing in specific projects. So for instance, they would invest in a Ghana project and simply basically put up the, the, the finance right up front and really just um, in return, we, release, we would release what we call these verified carbon units uh, at a specific rate um, over the next kind of 15 years or so. So they are really just investing in those specific projects. Um, and that also then really finances the other activities that we're, we're, we're undertaking there, which are, again, aquacultures and agricultures in that sense. Um, so there's a couple different business models at play. Carbon is the one that funds projects, uh, funds that, that infrastructure, um, but at the same time allows us to, to independently undertake um, these other or engage in these other industries like aquacultures, for example. Very cool. Looks like we have a question from uh, Syed Khaled. Apologies if I just butchered <laughs> your name, name pronunciation there. Um, but they ask, Yannick, do you have any plan work in Bangladesh? Uh, do I? Do we have any planned work in Bangladesh? Is that is that correct? Yeah. Yep. So um, I. I was actually in Bangladesh two weeks ago, um, and I was meant to be there today. I was meant to arrive back today. Uh, unfortunately, I uh, tested positive for COVID just uh, an hour before my flight yesterday. Um, but yes, we are very active in Bangladesh, um, both in terms of our work with World Food Program, um, much more in a development capacity, but we also um, are about to launch a very large carbon project with the Bangladesh government, um, a big kind of restoration project for blue uh, carbon. So Bangladesh is probably in the top three uh, countries that we, we work in, in terms of the size and scope of that project. Great. Thanks for that question, Syed. And Yannick, hope you're feeling better or it didn't get you too bad. Um, Wild River Yannick. version, yeah. <laughs> okay. Good. Uh, can you share a little bit, I guess, picking one of your projects or or maybe a, a collection of a few, wondering just if you can speak to some of the metrics on the carbon on the carbon side, wondering, um, you know, if you were to put some metrics in a, in a one pager for future project developers um, or investors looking to get in this space, what sort of metrics would you point to from... Um, some of the projects you have under your belt at the moment. Yeah, um, that's a great one. So when we talk about, you know, blue carbon, blue carbon is a term that is, is really being used a lot more these days. And the main reason is one, simply because blue carbon ecosystems, like the ones I listed before, salt marshes, mangrove forests, seagrass meadows, um, they sequester so much more and they're so much more productive in terms of carbon. So let's say you take a, a one hectare or one acre of uh, rainforest in the Amazon, you know, you're looking at about 300 tons of carbon over that life cycle, let's call that 20 years. But when you're looking at mangrove forests or salt marshes, you know, it's up to a thousand. So it is that much more productive. You know, it's, it's, it's three to four times at least more productive. I mean, there's some estimates that they're 30 times more productive. So what you have instinctively is, is this, this approach um, and this, this market um, that is, is really hungry for this kind of blue carbon. Um, and so, you know, for us, again, we are very much engaging in real estate. A big part of our job is to actually secure land uh, internationally. Um, but you know, once you have that land, and of course, this is quite cheap land because it's heavily degraded and it's, there's a big scope for that. You know, we work across desert ecologies. We work across uh, floodplains like in Bangladesh. So very, very cheap land, uh, very, very, you know, high mark, uh, big market um, and a huge demand. So again, it, the, 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 the revenue streams are quite, um, yeah, are quite great. And of course, there's a lot of financing available for, for blue carbon specifically. But again, going back to the main metrics, um, you know, it's you're talking around a thousand tons over life cycle uh, for blue carbon. Um, and looking at the price, of course, of, of nature based uh, carbon uh, today, uh, global commodity prices is up is well over $15 per ton. 
Um, and that's really, really growing significantly. I mean, some estimates are that by uh, the end of this decade, so 2030, it's up to you know, well over 100 bucks. Um, so that's why a lot of companies are investing in projects themselves so that they have this kind of long um, kind of VCU release, this carbon release um, over the next kind of 20 years to cover their bases at the price of uh, commodity prices today. Um, but yeah, yeah, I hope that to some extent answers that. Yeah, it's interesting. Now, one of the things we've we've found challenging on the, um, you know, more uh, inland agricultural lands is just measuring of measuring of the carbon sequestration. Um, obviously, there are markets for it, but um, I think people are getting more and more rigorous about really wanting to quantify very uh, exactly what's going on. Um, how do you see that space of of measurement in in, in these atypical sequestration environments, at least relative to inland agriculture, how do you see that evolving over um, over the coming years? Yeah, great question. So I don't know if I've, I've changed the slides. So you have a bit of a visual cue as I talk about this point. Um, so there's, there's kind of two different carbon approaches or, or schools really. There's the kind of restoration where you have, well, we'll replant the Amazon um, and more kind of on a, on a restoration basis. And then you have this kind of agriculture space. And the agriculture space is really interesting um, because, you know, every farm is different. And so, you know, you need, it, it costs a lot of money to measure how much carbon your farm is capturing. Um, and if you, got, if you have a small farm, it, it's just not worth it, right? Because this, this can cost up to half a million dollars uh, typically around the quarter million dollar mark to kind of put a figure onto that carbon that's being taken in by your potato field or, or whatever. So you, you really need scale to make that work. Um, and so this is the biggest bottleneck for farmers is, you know, do I have enough land to make it worthwhile? Um, and oftentimes it's just not the case, but there is a lot of work being done to make this much more accessible using, for instance, satellite data, an imagery um, or new technology that's coming out that's able to measure carbon more effectively. In our, in our scenario, of course, it, it's more effective because we use a, a, a much larger area of land, right? Where, you know, a typical farm that we would work in, in this case, in the inland deserts of Namibia and the Kalahari Desert, where we're talking about 10,000 hectare. Um, and so that makes it viable because um, we're really talking economies of scale um, and, you know, turning a, a desert which has zero carbon into really a highly pr productive carbon sink, you know, the, the numbers are, are a bit more attractive in that scenario. But I can only really talk about, um, I suppose, our approach in nature-based um, agriculture, regenerative agriculture when it comes to carbon. But yeah, so there, there's a lot of movement happening. Every carbon is 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 come is really coming up, um, especially in, in these kind of entrenched traditional uh, agricultures, for instance, corn farming in, in the, the Midwest. So uh, uh, it, it's, it's one of the biggest um, uh, growing sectors within the carbon space. But again, the bottlenecks are just so much, so much greater than um, nature-based solutions. Thanks for that, really helpful. Great. Well, Yannick, thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, I guess one one uh, final question is you had your contact information up there. How can the folks listening live and those listening retroactively, how can they help you? Uh, when, when, when and how should they get in touch? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a, there's a couple of things that we're really um, pushing for right now. Obviously, we are um, launching some very big projects right now. Um, a lot of that is obviously through the, the framework of carbon in terms of finance. Um, you know, I think it was part of the disclaimer at the start, we're, we're not asking for um, investment, but you know, we, we do invite people to engage with us to some extent through carbon. Um, that's always a great talking point, great facilitator of, of projects. But at the same time, really, obviously, the, the reason why we're doing this is to create uh, productive uh, ecologies. And so we are currently developing um, a couple of really cool products. Uh, one is formulated uh, aquaculture feed for a huge sector. 
through um, blue-green ecosystem um, species uh, like salicornia um, that are really there to kind of support marine health uh, and create an alternative to, for instance, soy and some other products. Um, so we are, you know, always uh, seeking partners uh, in the agri-tech space to help us develop these novel um, biotech products and feed tech products as well. Um, and then just a general call for, I suppose, um, people that are around the world, um, if you do see an opportunity or to, to create some connections with local governments or on a national level uh, to, to launch some new product uh, projects uh, wherever you are in the world. I know some of you are, are based quite, quite far around the globe. Um, so, you know, we're always looking to, to scale to new countries that do have, you know, the same uh, set of issues that we've been talking about today, largely salinization, coastal flooding, uh, desertification, et cetera. So those would be my, my three extended asks. Terrific. Well, again, Yannick, thanks so much for joining us today and congrats on all the progress and uh, best of luck as you continue to, to scale this uh, very much. worthy endeavor. Um, also, thank you to those listening live and those listening uh, after the fact. Uh, as a reminder, we do host these agri-food conversations every Thursday at 3 p.m. Central Time. Um, if you do want to share this with a friend, uh, please do so. Uh, they can go to agrifoodconversations.com and sign up and they can see all past agri-food conversations and uh, a replay of this one in particular will be emailed to you in the next 24 hours. So join us next week. We'll be joined by Sam Norton, founder and CEO of Heron Farms, which is a uh, indoor vertical saltwater farm uh, producing food without any natural sunlight or fresh water. Um, so another interesting one in our month of oceans and aquaculture. Um, so I hope everyone has a wonderful day and uh, we will hopefully see you next week.